The Path is a teaching series sponsored by World Missionary Evangelism. We hope that this series will deepen your knowledge and walk in our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's your host, John Cathcart. Well, in the last program, we are talking about a problem that took place in the early church, the primitive church. That is the church of the book of Acts. When the widows of the Hellenistic party or group or side in the church seem to be getting ignored by the leaders of the church or at least by those who are appointed to take care of their needs. So when this was brought to the attention of the apostles, they ordered a meeting to be called. And at this meeting, they elected seven men of blameless character, high spiritual gifts and practical wisdom to form what we might call a committee of management and relieve the apostles from the burden of taking care of these sorts of things in order that they might devote their energies to prayer, study the word, pastoral work. Well, the advice was followed and seven men were presented to the apostles as suitable persons to do this job. And they were admitted to the duties of their position with prayer and the laying on of hands. Now, this is a big job because the church is getting big and they are taking care of the needs of many people. And these seven men had a big job laid on them. So they were admitted to the duties of their position with prayer and the laying on of hands, which henceforth has been adopted in every ordination to the office of a deacon. Now the seven men are interesting. Their names were Stephen, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, who was a proselyte of Antioch. Well, the first thing you notice is that every one of them has a Greek name. And this has often been appealed to as a proof of the conciliatoriness of the apostles as though they had elected every one of their committee from the very body of Hellenistic Jews which had found a reason to complain. But this understanding cannot be correct. Uh, it flies to an opposite extreme. The frequency which w with which Jews of this time adopted Greek names prevents us from drawing any conclusion as to their nationality. You can't tell by the name of these seven deacons whether they're Greeks or whether they're Jews because Jews adopted Greek names. But although we cannot be certain about the conjecture or the idea the tradition that three of them were Hebrews and three of them were Hellenists and one was a proselyte, that is a, 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 a man who had been converted from paganism, probably a Greek, to Judaism and then became a Christian. It's only natural to suppose that the choice of them from different sections of the church would be adopted as a matter of fairness and common sense. And the fact that a Gentile like Nicholas should have been selected to fill an office so honorable and so responsible is one of the many indications which marks the gradual dawn of a new conception regarding the kingdom of God. Now, this is a subtle point. The very selection of these men, their names indicates a change, something is changing in the thinking of the Christians. There's a new idea regarding the nature of the kingdom of God. Well, only two of the seven are in any way known to us. One is Stephen, the other is Philip. Yet this election was a crisis in church history. Now, this is where you wish that when Luke was writing the book of Acts, he would have taken time to tell us a little bit more about these other five men. But he doesn't, and that's unfortunate, but doubtless in the mind of the Spirit. But this election was a crisis in church history. Now, we're going to glance at the work of Philip the Evangelist hereafter, but we must now follow the career of Stephen. 
which brief as it was, marked the beginning of an, a, a memorable epoch. Stephen must be regarded as the immediate predecessor of him who took the most prominent part in bringing about his martyrdom. In other words, we'll put it this way, you've got to see Stephen as the forerunner of Paul. To some extent, and I don't want to push this too far, but to some extent, Stephen is to Paul what John the Baptist was to Jesus. And Stephen must be regarded, and this is very important, as having been in a far truer sense than Gamaliel, the rabbi himself, Stephen is the teacher of St. Paul. In fact, St. Paul has been called a, quote, colossal St. Stephen. But if the life of Stephen had been prolonged, had he not yet been summoned to a loftier sphere of activity, we don't know to what further heights of moral grandeur he might have attained. Now, I want to stop and say something here. We tend to think that Stephen was martyred and well, the church lost a great leader, which it did. The church lost a great spokesman. But don't get the idea that we go to heaven in order to sit down, wine and dine, do nothing, push clouds around and play on harps. There is work to be done in heaven. Work has to be done. And Stephen must have been necessary to the purposes of God in heaven in the spiritual dimension, because that was where he was summoned. And the Lord, think of it this way, in Paul, the Lord had a replacement for Stephen. Well, we only possess a single speech to show Stephen's intellect and inspiration. And we're suffered to catch but this one single glimpse of his life. But the speech that Stephen gave, called Stephen's Apology, influenced the whole career of the greatest of the apostles, namely Paul, and the martyrdom of Stephen and his death is the very earliest of the martyrdoms of Christians. World Missionary Evangelism, through its wide variety of mission outreach programs, is an evangelical force in developing nations and it all begins with native missionaries. Called by Christ to do His work, our native missionaries are first and foremost soul winners. Often facing hostile opposition, they have the courage to reach out in compassion to the lost, sharing the good news with those in their communities. But that is just the beginning of WME's evangelistic programs. World Missionary Evangelism reaches children through vacation Bible schools, and Christian schools. So even as we feed the hungry bodies of little ones, we also feed their souls. For almost six decades, WME has been building churches in both urban and rural areas. Most of these churches are used every day of the week and become beacons of light in the areas where they serve. Churches not only provide worship opportunities, but they also offer a community gathering point, education, child care, and even serve as feeding centers for the hungry. WME not only sponsors native missionaries, we train them. World Missionary Evangelism has local pastoral education programs for new missionaries and continuing education programs for those who have been in the field for years. WME also has Bible colleges that provide degree programs for those seeking a fuller knowledge of the Bible and Christian outreach. The evangelism in World Missionary Evangelism is not just a part of our name. It defines our mission, our focus, and is at the heart of everything we do. Well, the appointment of the seven deacons, partly because of their zeal and power, and partly because of the greater freedom secured for the apostles, 
led to the marked success in the progress of the church. Not only was the number of disciples in Jerusalem greatly multiplied, isn't that interesting? But even a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. And up to this time, the acceptance of the gospel did not involve any rupture with Judaism. It was consistent with the most scrupulous devotion to the observances of Judaism. And it must be borne in mind that the priests in Jerusalem and a few other cities were a very big, a, a multitudinous body, and that it was only the narrow aristocratic clique of a few alien families who were, dis, who were Sadducees in theology and Herodians in politics has kind of messed up our concept of the priesthood in that day and time. Now, many of the lower ranks of the priesthood were doubtless Pharisees, and as Pharisees were devoted to the doctrine of the resurrection, there was nothing inconsistent in their traditions in admitting the messiahship of a risen savior. Now, I'm gonna stop here to say something. The Jews didn't have any problem in accepting Jesus as Messiah or as a resurrected savior. What is going to cause the problem is recognizing him as the son of God, as being divine. That's a totally different matter. So such a belief would at this time, that is the belief in a Messiah, a risen savior, resurrected, at this time, and indeed long afterwards, this would have made little difference in their general position, although if they were true believers, it would make a vast difference in their inward life. The simplicity, the fervor, the unity, the spiritual gifts of the little company of Galileans would be likely to attract the serious and the thoughtful I mean, their behavior, their lifestyle, this is what gets attention. It's not sermons that get people converted. The Holy Spirit does the converting. We do the testifying. It's not our eloquence and our exegesis. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. But more people come to the Lord and accepting the Savior by observing Christians. You might see the other side of that sword Many people are turned away by seeing inconsistent lives. And the people that watched these early Christians would be won by these graces far more irresistible than any logic, far more ir irresistible or irresistible than appeals of powerful eloquence. And the mission of the apostles at this time was no apostolate of rhetoric. Let me explain that. The mission of the apostles wasn't that of preaching, talking. Nor would they have pretended to be anything other than what they were, illiterate men, untrained in the schools of technical theology and rabbinic wisdom. And had the disciples not been ignorant men, had it been otherwise, the arguments for the truth of Christianity which is derived from the extraordinary rapidity of its dissemination or spreading, would have lost its force. The weapons of apostolic warfare were not carnal. Converts were won not by leaning on argument, but by the power of a new testimony and the spirit of a new life. Don't underestimate that one, the spirit of a new life. Well, up to this period, the name of Stephen had not occurred in Christian history. And we don't know any of the circumstances of his conversion to Christianity. We don't read anywhere in the New Testament how and why and where Stephen became a Christian. His recognition, however, and this is very important, his recognition of the glorified figure which he saw in his ecstatic vision as he is being stoned to death. 
as the figure of him who on earth had called himself, quote, the Son of Man, unquote, makes it highly likely that Stephen was one of those who had enjoyed the advantage of hearing from the living Jesus and the advantage of drawing from its very fountainhead the water of the river of life. Well, we'd really like to know more about one, namely Stephen, who in so brief a space of time played a part so nobly wise. But it was with Stephen, as it has been with myriads of others, whose names have been written in the book of life, that they have been unknown among men, or known only during one brief epoch, and perhaps for one deed. Now, I remember my father and my stepmother, who were really outstanding people of God, saying, talking about prophecy and the prophet, and this may shock us in a day of super efficiency, but they said some people, some prophets are called just to prophesy one time. Now we think if some is a prophet, they should be prophesying morning, noon, and night. That's not necessarily so in the economy of God. So for a moment, and for a moment only, the first martyr, namely Stephen, steps into the full line of history. And our insight into Stephen and into his greatness is derived almost solely from the record of a single speech given on a single day. The last speech which Stephen ever uttered on the last day of his mortal life. At the heart of everything World Missionary Evangelism does is reaching out and saving the lost through sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We do this through native missionaries. Right now, we have many native missionaries who need sponsors. That's right, partners just like you who will help them become full-time workers for Christ. That provides this Native missionary with the ability to give his life full-time to gospel outreach. We also need Bible, and that allows us to share the word with those we reach in the mission field. The evangelism in World Missionary Evangelism is not just a part of our name. It defines our mission, our focus, and is at the heart of everything we do. We're talking about Stephen, Stephen the deacon, Stephen the spokesperson, Stephen the first martyr. Now, it was the faith of Stephen, together with his loving energy, which led to his choice as one of the seven deacons. And no sooner was he elected than he became the most prominent of them all. The grace which shone in his colleagues shone yet more brightly in him. And actually, Stephen stood on a level with the apostles in the power 
of working wonders among the people. Now many a man who would otherwise have died unknown has revealed to others his inherent greatness on being entrusted with authority. That's an amazing fact. Uh, some people never show what they are until you give them authority or put them in a position of responsible charge. And that was the case with Stephen. And the immense part played by Stephen in the history of the church was due to the development of powers which might have remained latent but for the duties laid on him by his new position. Well, the distribution of arms or money or food or clothing, whatever, seems to have been a part only of the task that was assigned to him. And by the way, someone that does this is called an almoner, A-L-M-O-N-E-R, uh, that's a, a noun based on the word arms. So if someone is giving, given the job of handing out food and clothing, they are called an almoner. Well, like Philip, Stephen was an evangelist as well as a deacon. Yes, you can hold both offices. Man can hold more than one office. And the speech that Stephen delivered before the Sanhedrin, or the Jewish Council of Seventy, the governing body, shows as it does the logical force and concentrated fire of a great orator and a practiced controversialist. Stephen had been around, he had been speaking, he, he was able to engage in debate. And these talents may explain the stir which was caused by his preaching, not by his apology when he was stoned, but it was the preaching of Stephen that got the Jews worked up. Well, the scene of Stephen's preaching, it was the Hellenistic or Greek culturally leaning synagogues of Jerusalem. And to an almoner in a city where so many were poor, and to a Hellenist of unusual eloquence, opportunities would constantly recur in which he was not only permitted, but urged to explain the tenets of the new society. So he is a very eloquent man, and you want to understand what this new society believes, they would see it as a society. They wouldn't see it as we, as we see the church. They didn't see it as the church. They saw it as a new society. So we want to know, okay, what, what are the rules of this society? What does this society believe? Let's get Stephen. Stephen can explain it simply. Well, hitherto that society was in full communion with the Jewish church. And Stephen alone, this is very important, it's only Stephen who was charged with utterances of a disloyal tendency against the tenets of the Pharisaism. So Stephen is the first Christian preacher that causes Jews to say, hey, 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 wait a minute. This is different from what we believe. Up until this time, Christianity is really part of Judaism, if you can even call it Christianity. This new group is part of Judaism. And they're just saying, they're saying Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus was crucified, Jesus has risen again. But this man, is saying things that are different, that, that cut against the grain. And this is a proof of how different his preaching was from the 12. Now, you've got to understand this. At this point, Stephen is ahead of the 12. Isn't that interesting? His preaching is very different from the other 12. And it demonstrates how much early he had, uh, he had arrived at the true apprehension of the words of Jesus respecting the extent and nature of his kingdom. Now, I was testifying to a fairly young Christian the other day, business person, and they were talking to me about some conflicts they were going through in business uh, with, it, with regional authorities 
municipal authorities, I said, well, we are in this world, but not of it. And the person said to me, you know, young Christian, the first time I heard that, I didn't understand it. it. Took me a while before I understood it. There were things Jesus said, he just said them and, and let it go. And uh, if he wanted to draw your attention to something, he said, uh, him that hath ears to hear, let him hear. That means, as Walter Fletcher would say when he was in the Navy, listen up and pay attention. When Jesus said, him that hath ears to hear, let him hear, he didn't mean if you have physical ears, you need to hear. He meant, I just said something. Do you get it? You need to think about it. Well, what in the mind of Peter was still but a grain of mustard seed, that is the gospel sown in the soil of Judaism, had already grown in the soul of Stephen into a mighty tree. The 12 disciples, you've got to realize, were still lingering in the portals of the synagogue. And for them, the new wine of the kingdom of heaven had not yet burst the old wine sense. Don't get the idea when Jesus started preaching, the people that followed him said, oh, yes, we've got the whole thing. We understand it completely. You won't understand God before eternity starts going. So they didn't understand it. And as yet they were only regarded as the heads of a Jewish sect. And although they believed that their faith would soon be the faith of the world, they did not dream of doing away with mosaism. Sixty years ago, world missionary evangelism began when John E. Douglas Sr. accepted the challenge of caring for six orphan children in India. From this act of love spring a work that has grown to include children's homes, schools, leper clinics, vocational and agricultural education, disaster relief, feeding programs, drilling water wells, and building churches. And at the heart of all of WME's work has been living out the Great Commission to take the news of salvation through Jesus to everyone we meet. By giving $60 a month to our 60 for 60 campaign, you can help us expand our outreach.